Well, hello, Tansi, Mio, uh, Ponipita, Gisgao. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Sakawa Snobis. I'm a uh, Plains Cree Salto of the George Gordon First Nation, which is in Saskatchewan, Canada. And uh, I am the founder and executive director of Great Plains Action Society. We are a 100% led uh, Indigenous social and uh, climate justice organization working in Iowa and eastern Nebraska. And frankly, we do work throughout the Great Plains as well and a lot of national work um, with uh, uh, many national coalitions uh, working on uh, climate, uh, land, and healing justice issues. And um, I want to thank you for being here today and honoring us with your attentiveness while we discuss how Indigenous folks are pushing back at Big Ag through the revitalization of Indigenous first foods um, from like farm to table. And um, uh, today our panel consists of Indigenous folks working in various aspects of the food sovereignty and first foods realm. Uh, Foxy One Feather is a Chichimeca of the Guanajuato, uh, from Guanajuato, Mexico, and grew up here in Oakland. Uh, she is a first food steward who has created gardens at the Lower Brule Reservation and also here in Oakland. Um, Anthony Warrior is Shawnee and the owner and operator of Warrior's Plate Catering and Consulting in Nebraska and caters all over the Great Plains. And Shelly Buffalo is Meskwaki and a decolonial pathfinder who has coordinated the Meskwaki First Food Sovereignty Initiative and a seed keeper who has collaborated on several seed rematriation projects. Um, and so uh, these are our uh, experts today that we're going to be hearing from. Uh, but first, I'm going to uh, introduce, I guess, the reason for this panel, uh, which is colonial capitalist farming practices, and um, talk about how experts like our panelists are working to solve um, this problem that has been created not just for indigenous peoples, but for our earth uh, and for all of us, all living things uh, living on, on this earth. Um, so I don't know if any of you know this fact, but it, uh, it, it is a very important fact to start off with. According to the USDA, um, who shared a study found in rural uh, America, uh, of all private U.S. agricultural land, whites account for 96% of the owners, 97% of the value, and 98% of the acres. So this was published in 2002, but um, when you do further research into this, you'll find that that number hasn't really changed much. Um, and also, what that statistic tells us is that um, there's a correlation between what is happening in farming, right, via big ag, colonial uh, capitalist farming practices, and the people who are carrying it out, right? So um, basically, it is you know, colonial invaders, colonial settlers that have um, implemented these practices that has got us to where we are right now. Um, and indigenous practices are basically the antithesis to this type of uh, farming. And so um, that's why we're here today, so we can talk about that. Um, because what happens in the process of colonization is um, the a theft of, of land and resources. And then during that, um, uh, that aspect of it, right, during, well, during the whole process of colonization, uh, you have to mitigate the local population through, uh, you know, either annihilation, assimilation, enslavement, um, you know, uh, those, those uh, very violent means. And, and so um, that's actually what's happened to the land as well, right? Um, the land itself um, has been, um, uh, has gone through a very violent process um, here uh, in the U.S. and Turtle Island and, frankly, all over the world. Right now, um, indigenous peoples make up 3% of the world's population, but they are protecting 80% of the world's biodiversity. And so um, in the farming and ranching states of the Midwest, such as Iowa, Nebraska, Missouri, and Kansas, the push to oust and kill indigenous peoples for the land was severe and violent. And I'm going to use Iowa as an example um, for this talk, um, because Iowa is basically ground zero for big ag. 
Um, it is the most biologically colonized state in the country and the number one contributor to the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. So big ag really has taken over. But it's not just big ag. I mean, it really is colonial capitalist farming practices, which is sad to say, but also something that we would say the family farmer also practices, right? So um, uh, Iowa used to transition um, from um, woodland at the Mississippi River to uh, um, oak savanna and marshland uh, and then to uh, tall grass prairie. So 80% of Iowa actually used to be tall grass prairie. And as we know, tall grass prairie um, uh, harnesses uh, and sequesters a lot of carbon with roots 8 to 12 feet deep and um, it used to be as biologically diverse as some of our rainforests. Uh, however, now it's as biologically diverse as uh, a desert. Um, and um, this is a result of um, over overuse of land, um, like almost like maniacal use of land, um, turning crops over faster than you can, you know, imagine. Um, and you know, so what we have uh, just a ton of pesticides being sprayed, which are frankly are made up of petroleum products, um, you know, herbicides, uh, fertilizers, uh, and animal waste. Uh, because we have a lot of CAFOs, and um, Big Ag likes to tell us that spraying pig waste is a form of fertilizer on our fields. So there are folks uh, in parts of Iowa and Nebraska and, you know, just the, these states that are actually suffering from really strange diseases because of that. Um, so, you know, we've got an issue with ethanol. We have an issue with CAFOs, concentrated animal feed operations. There are uh, 15,000 of them in Iowa, and Kim Reynolds, the governor, thinks we have room for 35,000 more. Um, there are 40 million pigs in Iowa and 3 million people. Um, and, you know, for instance, we could rematriate about 9 million acres of that land uh, to back to tall grass prairie, but uh, right now we have a welfare system going on where farmers uh, will, like, uh, um, plant, like, right up to a riverbank or on slopes over 9% or in marshland because if it, uh, the crops don't come through, which they won't, right, um, because of flooding and slopes, um, they get um, insurance on it. So, um, you know, uh, Iowa is not being uh, utilized the way it should be utilized. Um, it's the only uh, state that is bordered by the Missouri and the Mississippi rivers, which makes it super unique. Um, and not just Iowa, but like, you know, I'm just, I'm using Iowa as our example, but like Iowa, Kansas, Missouri, Nebraska, um, you know, South Dakota, like this, this whole area of the world, the Great Plains, um, is um, essentially exceedingly biologically modified. Um, and so we um, at Great Plains Action Society, we are fighting, you know, big ag with drone footage, actions, you know, uh, working to change oppressive legislation like ag gags or implement good legislation like uh, factory farm moratoriums, um, and basically working hard to educate the public uh, about the consequences of colonial capitalist farming and the propaganda that is very far reaching. Um, and so, you know, Big Egg colonizes land and commodifies food systems for ultimate profit. Um, and, and as I said earlier, indigenous pathways uh, for food growth do not. As Piao Piao Mox Mox, chief of the Walla Walla said in 1855, goods and the earth are not equal. Goods are for using on the earth. I do not know where they have given land for goods. Um, so as we're working hard, our, our org, to push back politically at Big Egg, there are the very important indigenous culture bearers and ecological experts that are implementing the resurgence of first foods and food sovereignty and practices uh, and currently putting into practice what Piao Piao Mox Mox said 170 years ago. So um, that's our intro, and this is why we're here today. Um, to listen to the experts. And I would like to introduce Foxy One Feather to go next. <laughs> Hi, nice to be here. Um, so I guess I would start by saying that I come from a family of more considered immigrants from Mexico, but we weren't immigrants, we were migrants. We migrated everywhere before the border was there. And so with that being said, With that being said, my grandparents were field workers, my parents were field workers, and I worked in the field when I was younger. And my mom worked really hard to keep me out of the field. But 
I just couldn't. I was always in the dirt. And so she had a garden, and with that, I started growing food and started teaching my daughters how to grow food. Then I relocated to Oakland when I was younger and saw that there was no community gardens. The, most of the places that we live either had a balcony or just windows, so I started planting my gardens indoors. Then my neighbors started noticing that I was having fruits and vegetables, and then we, I started showing them how to do it, and then we started trading. Then I eventually got another place that had something maybe this big, started planting there. And then down the street, there was an older Asian woman that came over with a basket one day, and she had vegetables. And we didn't speak the same language, but she walked up and just kind of like this, showed me this, and showed, pointed at some of the stuff I had in the garden, and we traded. And from that day forward, I would come back, and there would be a basket of vegetables, and you know, she came and took vegetables from there. So fast forward to 2016, there was this big call to go to Standing Rock, and I went. One-way ticket, Standing Rock. And I thought, how can I help these people? Maybe I'll go help in the kitchen. That didn't work out. So anyway, fast forward to after Standing Rock, I end up in Eagle Butte, and there was a garden there, space for a garden. A woman was getting ready to plant, but she couldn't commit. So I said, well, I don't have anything else to do. I'll stay and help. So when I did the research, when I first got there and we started planting, I was thinking, like, what would they need? And when I went to the local trading post, there was nothing available for them. So I thought, well, they kind of need everything. So we planted and planted from seed. I had people come and say, you can't grow from seed here. And literally everything in the garden flourished. And from that year forward, we were there for three seasons, donated everything that we grew to the local community and were able to teach them how to grow their own food, how to prepare, dry it, how to can it, and then they would prepare it for the community meetings later on. And I think I kind of felt like there that it was really bad because they had to travel 45 minutes to and from stores. They had to give gas money. They were like $2 cucumbers. And it's still like that. You know, it's like that in Iowa. It's like that out here. Out here, the difference is they have liquor stores everywhere else. And out there, they don't have any kind of stores. And I think one of the biggest things we need is access to land. And we need access to transportation a lot of the times. Because a lot of the people on the reservations can't get from one place to the community gardens. And I, mean, I, I don't know. I just, <laughs> I'm not sure what else to really talk about, but the fact that we really do need help in reintroducing our foods to our people. We need to start teaching them how to grow their own food again, their own cultural food, their, their traditional foods, and people like this wonderful chef here can show them how to prepare it. There's a high rate of diabetes, a high rate of heart disease because of all the commods, because of the powdered eggs, the canned meat, the big block of beautiful cheese that we love, but is so unhealthy for us. And I am just passionate about reintroducing our foods back to our people. And ending food deserts. And ending food deserts, period. This is destroying the, the earth. All this tilling and all the dust in the air, everything is joined, destroying the earth. And we need to really start helping our people. So you've been um, working on some uh, gardens here in Oakland as well. Yeah, and we have we, we go around and we kind of ask people if, what they need. And most of the time, they don't have locations to plant. So we donate um, packages with pots. And if it's the spring, then we give them seedlings. If not, then we give them stuff for the following year, tiny little packages, little tools. I provide books. I provide journals. I provide pens, document everything, trial and error. And I do it here. I, I, we actually try to do it wherever we go. We try to reach out to the local community. But Oakland definitely is, especially with gentrification, they're losing a lot of their space. And so I, I think sometimes we forget about the urban natives too, because a lot of urban natives don't have reservations or don't have places to call home. Well, 70% of our people live on, uh, don't live on the reservation anymore. I mean, Foxy's work, Foxy and her husband, Alton One Feather, um, their work is as grassroots as it gets. I mean, they don't have, you know, um, their own you know, org or even name for like what it is they do. Uh, and Great Plains Action Society, we do what we can to, you know, support that work. Um, we just still haven't gotten to the point where we can, you know, provide like what we would love to provide. Um, and that is like, you know, full-time salaries uh, and, and, and resources.
uh, so that they can flourish and, and bring this like really truly uh, vital experience uh, uh, to um, our people. And not just our people, but frankly everybody. Um, everybody needs, needs to learn how to uh, grow food indigenously. You good? <laughs> I'm good, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, and next, uh, we're going to hear from Anthony Warrior. Very good. Thank you. As a chef, I'm very, it's very hard for me to sit down, right? <laughs> so we're all constantly on the move. Hoisilasa uh, Mamo. Beautiful word, right? Really difficult to say once in a while, but that's a Shawnee language, and it means uh, I hope you are all in good health. So that's my blessing. And first of all, Nyawan Koa, big thank you. Of all these events here that SoCap has allowed us this little 45 minutes to kind of express it to you, and you guys come to join us. That's a lot. This is the first steps in these, in these ventures that we're looking for. So through this process of these days, myself, um, I'm absentee Shawnee. I'm from Oklahoma, twice removed, three times removed. We were originally in Ohio River Valleys. And you know how this kind of process worked over the years. If you don't know Native history, I encourage you to look through it. Not all of us experienced the same atrocities. Some of us really took a lot of different tactics to avoiding uh, being eliminated and hence to where we are now today. I'm going to let you know in 25 years of cooking I was in healthcare, I was an LPN, I worked in the hospitals, I watched people in front of me die. I watched them come in as young as 45, 55 experiencing heart attacks, they were dying of high blood pressure, diabetes. I myself am a diabetic. Okay? I'm also an addict, a very big addict. And what I mean by I, I suffer from addiction, I suffer from a food addiction, all right? Addiction, food addiction is just as severe as alcohol or drugs. The body's release of chemical to be able to make your body want more and more and more of something. I shouldn't be 320 pounds. Frito-Lay makes me that way, all right? So I love my chips. The, the thing is, being a chef over all these years, I followed a food guide. I followed a nutrition value that was put upon me on our nutrition value. I was in elder service, I was in casinos, and I worked for, 20, for 10 casinos across the United States, including Morongo, uh, New York, I was in Aquasazi, I was in Seneca, these are large casinos. Right in Niagara Falls, I was there. I was also in Oklahoma, I was in Florida, at these casinos, native-run casinos. But guess what, in 25 years, not one single native casino, what, not one single native chef, okay? So, I'm not saying that's our role in life, but when it came to navigating the foods that were available to us, in these casinos, how many here can name a native ingredient, right? Can anybody? A native ingredient. Wild rice. Okay, wild rice. Anybody else? Acorns. Anybody? I want to hear from our other side, okay? <laughs> <laughs> you natives are just rattling them off, right? <laughs> but seriously, you know, for our, our non-native educators, that's one of my roles here is to kind of drop a little bit of seed that may be developed. 10, 10 years from now, five years from now in your efforts to be able to see where this global impact and this environmental issues are coming from. 60% of the Americas' produce has saved the world. Irish with potatoes, tomatoes, all these things that were sent over overseas, corn, polenta. How many Italians love your polenta, right? So a lot of these products were sent across the world from the Americas. But when we come over here, Big Ag has put us down to how many crops? Two, right? And I heard on NPR, because I live in Nebraska, and when you fly over Nebraska, what do you see? All right, there's not much trees, right. right? Big squares. When you fly over South Dakota, when you fly over Iowa, big squares, right? And now, the worst part about it is it's pivots right in the middle of it. And we're on the largest aquifer in the world, right? So all that groundwater is coming up. But anyway, we'll go into that more later. Corn and soybeans, right? And the corn in the fields, you can't eat it. The soybeans in the fields, you can't eat it. We're in a food desert, and if you've ever been to a reservation, how many of our people here have been to a reservation? Okay, 50 miles to drive there, 9 miles off the main highway, 9 miles back, and jobs are probably about 120 miles out of the way, round trip, minimum. The problem is, when I came into cooking, I was told natives eat forever, natives eat you know, this, and it was wrong, it was very wrong. And because of that, my family, we all suffered. My grandmother and my grandfather deteriorated at the age of 60. Feet cut off, arms cut off, and my grandkids, or my kids, didn't get to meet them. They died too early. My, my uncles, my aunties, they died too early. They didn't get to see our family circle, our circle of life. 
You know, the Lion King, hold the little cub up, you know, that kind of. <laughs> so through that time, on, a, on 120 years of removal, we knew the best way to, to destroy people, and that's to get rid of their food systems, to make them unhealthy, to put them on places and give them food that they're supposed to eat. Don't leave this reservation to go hunt. Don't go get your food. We're going to give it to you, and you stay right here. So in 120, 50 years, I gave this knowledge yesterday, 1924. Native Americans became citizens of this country. 1924, not because... Six, not, even, even, not, not even some of us till 63. Yeah, so 63, 62 was when we gained our voting rights, all right? So that's kind of a, a, a big push for me as a Native chef. I have made it a mission for me on all these reservations of all these people that have traveled to find foods that we once had in the area. Foraging, natural farming practices. Not all of us were farmers. We had trade routes amongst these rivers. And you can find these villages in Mitchell, South Dakota that have corn from Mexico. You can find up in the uh, mounds up in uh, Ohio, relics from South America. We had trade systems here that were very packed with commerce, packed with food, and we had salts, we had natural sugars. We had all these things that was at our discretion and our alliances, our commerce, and our worth was built down there. Strip it all away and give us commodities, we die. So that's where we're at today. My purpose is to take all these ingredients I'm sourcing, I'm finding, and I'm working with collaborative uh, co-ops on these reservations, off the reservations, inner cities, and what I'm doing is I'm creating a food lab. Anybody know Chef Sean Sherman, sous chef? Okay, he brought us to the, the front. 25 years of work, and he, did, he got a James Beard Award. I'm jealous, right? I was working in Farmstead <laughs> with Chef Seamus Feely when he got his. And now I, this guy passed me up? Anyway, <laughs> so my efforts, I, I got some bias. In this but, that, but, but we're here. We're now here. And identification of medical, mental uh, illness is linked to food. Uh, I did the Indigenous People Summit this year in Omaha. I cooked for them. I did a presentation. The leading diabetic consultant out of D.C. came into my kitchen. I want to hear your story again about your diabetes because I dropped from 14.1 A1C down to a 5.9 in 90 days, no meds. Mm -hmm. He says, my doctor says, you don't do that. You, you lose one point in 90 days. How did you do 14.1? So I told him my story of how I did it. He comes back to me, the leading guy out of, out of Washington, says, I want to introduce myself. I'm the leading diabetic consultant for the United States. And I says, are you speaking to me as corporate or are you speaking to me as a person? He goes, I want to speak to you as a person. I can't say this. And he says, diabetes is curable, diabetes is preventable. But I can't say that. He says, but people like you can lead that. So my efforts from that point forward was what I did on myself, what I did with the elders in the Santee, Dakota area, to challenge them to eat better with whole products, not farm products, not, not the stuff you see in the stores, but actually natural grown products. My elders started dropping their A1Cs immediately just with eating whole foods and knocking out all, all the foods we have on our shelves. The last thing I want to conclude with is pushing forward in these, I can take two more minutes of this? That means five for me. Right. So, if you're ever in the kitchen and the chef says, two minutes, you'll get it in five minutes. So um, some of the things that, that we're doing right now is find these cooperatives. I was just in Wisconsin, drove all the way to Omaha, got a flight, got here. I spent three days out there helping them harvest, helping them cook their ingredients that they're coming, pulling out of the fields. And the, there's like 200 varieties of corn that was here in the States. And, and we've isolated ourselves to that beautiful little sweet corn. All right. So one of our elders once said that the, the, the American farmer has learned how to take something edible and make it inedible. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot of truth to that. But with my efforts to take these collaborative uh, efforts from these reservations from New York to uh, California, I would like to have these growers supply me with product. I don't want to go to Cisco. I don't want to go to these big name companies. I want a, I want a native cooperative of how we can pool our resources and fi open up those trade routes once again so I can start building for the, uh, the Indian Health Services qualified and uh, fabricated menus that were indigenous to their region of their people. We talk about genetic modification. A lot of these tribes have been in their regions for thousands of years. We're only 120 years removed before reservation systems were implemented, some of us a little bit longer. But over that time, for thousands of years compared to that one little bit of 120, to implement that food back into their food systems that their bodies recognize. The spiritual aspect of our food is we have many ceremonies of many tribes that commemorate our food spiritually. Mm -hmm. When you're born, you're given a feast. When you die, you're given a feast. 
During the middle of the year, we give feasts for our elders. And we put on those tables the foods that our elders recognize. If not, we put Cheetos on there. We put all these hamburgers on there. Our elders over there are going to snub us, right? They look like, like kids do. Yeah. <laughs> they want food. We need food. Our kids need our food. And we need to relearn that. Put our bodies back into the natural balance that it once was. So these efforts have been done for 25 years. 25 years of my time, seed gathering, planting methods, government funding, grant funding, hits, we're all happy, and then it dies. And we lose all that effort. It happens again, then it dies. It's non-sustainable. So with a cooperative, collaborative of pushing back on these ancient farmlands that are rich, that they're monocropping, if we can start to figure out how we can get to the point of negotiating land buybacks, in, in the Land Act uh, of uh, was it 1926, they, they took a, na a native reservation, they put a non-native here, a native here, Check a non-native here, so there's nothing continuous with the land. So now we have to buy back our own land to try these efforts. And of course money drives everything, but that food was our commerce. That food is what we use for trade. We'll never get back to that, I do know that. But the efforts that we're gonna push forward to try to sustain these efforts again for the overall health wellness of it is important for me and my drive and many other chefs that are coming up in the ranks. I think I'm like getting a little too old to stay on my feet all day. But these young kids, give them that knowledge and that wisdom. I'm not gonna take up too much of your time. We got another. But the last thing I, I have for you, again, the last, last thing, <laughs> is the fact that once we get these efforts off the road, off the ground, I, think, I believe there's a niche in people that are health conscious enough to want to learn what proper seed and corn, bean, squash, all of our food once had as far as nutrition value, to be able to, to sustain yourselves and to be able to lead to health. We, we have a concept mm -hmm. that's called food in the womb. When a mother feeds her baby while the baby's in the womb, that food, is it? Finish up. Oh, okay. So <laughs> the, the food in the womb actually chemically creates the baby's mentality, the process for the brain to process. On reservations, depression, suicide, uh, health issues, fetal alcohol syndromes, all these things that are affecting our children are not leading to our future leaders and they're not allowing our families to be a circle anymore. We lost that. So now we're going to start working back towards that feeding in the womb all the way to the day we put that food on the table for our elders. So. Yawa, thank you for allowing me to express myself. Any questions, please catch me. <laughs> thank you so much, Anthony. <laughs> Basically, to summarize, I think what Anthony's saying is that, um, you know, a fiscal investment into what folks like these folks are doing, or what people are doing, like right here, ecological, tra traditional ecological, ecological knowledge, um, you're getting a return of like healthy food and a better life. Um, so just ask yourself um, what wealth means to you and what what that actually is in the long run. And so our next um, speaker is Shelly Buffalo. Take it away, Shelly. All righty. <laughs> I'm going to start my timer and stick to it. <laughs> Always lead by example. So, yeah, like I'll follow his example instead. So um, thank you, everybody, for attending this session. Um, there's something that uh, I noticed and I'm going to call out, and that's um, I think we um, our session has been put in a hallway. Um, and, um, and I just want to say, like, I think that's um, very telling. Um, because um, indigenous leaders are not supported, we're not funded. Uh, we do so much of this work um, overextending ourselves um, constantly, um, sometimes at the cost of our health and our families, right? Um, because we are not funded, because we are not supported. And um, the interesting thing about that is that the indigenous impact on food systems, on climate change, on the protection of, of land, water, and air is, is, is incredible. And so the fact that um, our session is in a hallway, <laughs> I mean, I think it's, this is a hallway, um, and not in the largest auditorium at, um, at this event and attended by hundreds of people um, interested in how they can invest in us. This is very telling. So I'm gonna say this. Um, 
I just saw in Grist Magazine the 2021 uh, COP26 Climate Change Conference pledged $1.7 billion to support indigenous efforts to protect uh, their rights and land. So only 17% of this money actually went to indigenous people. Um, indigenous leaders were not consulted in the design of the pledge. Um, so the large organizations take their cuts. What trickles down to indigenous hands is nominal. Um, and uh, indigenous women in particular receive less, roughly 5%. And quite honestly, I can say this from experience that indigenous women are doing the bulk of the work because not only are we doing this advocacy, not only are we doing this grassroots, um, like in literally in the dirt, growing the food, uh, we are also providing the care for our families, for our communities, um, and um, completely unsupported once again. Um, and often, uh, you know, unfortunately, the same thing happens at the tribal government level. Um, please uh, remember that uh, the tribal government systems were systems put in place by the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Um, and they were designed to supplant our traditional leadership systems, which were systems, complicated systems, very complex systems that, um, that ensured democracy, ensured a, that, um, the you know food and 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 other needs um, were distributed in ways that cared for those that needed it the most, um, and there was um, equal representation amongst you know all of uh, the members of of um, any given um, community. Um, so the BIA uh, supplanted um, our our traditional leadership systems with tribal councils and and. Um, it, you know, it's the thing of it is, is that, you know, I, I do believe that tribes really are trying their best to serve their people. Problem is, is that that system is incredibly inefficient. It's incredibly bureaucratic. When I was food sovereignty coordinator for the Meskwaki tribe, um, I received a $300,000 grant. Well, the, the food sovereignty program received a $300,000 grant. Um, and, uh, I think that we were left with perhaps less than a third of that to actually um, to actually contribute to um, uh, building capacity in our program. Um, a percentage of that, a big percentage of that, just went to um, what is it? Uh, you know, the management or whatever. What is it called? Administration. Uh, it, thank you to admin, um, and then another percentage just went to pay for our our. Um, salaries. And a um, couple other numbers out there to kind of throw at you here. Um, another thing to problem with um, 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 doing this work um, within, uh, you know, the tribal government um, is that these days, uh, I don't know, you know, uh, uh, what I found at home is, is there's so much focus on um, profit, like what's gonna, what's gonna, you know, be the next casino, basically, what's gonna be the next cash cow. When I, I personally, you know, my, my strong, strong belief is that if we invest in community, then, um, you know, the economy is gonna follow. You know, really foundational um, to communities and to building any type of wealth. Like, let's get beyond even thinking about monetary wealth, because after all, um, <laughs> money is just, it's not real, it's an idea, it's an imaginary idea that we just all agree on. I, I don't agree on it, but, you know, that's the system we have to work um, with right now, and I think eventually we're going to have to get away from it, um, especially since there is, you know, an amassing of wealth um, in the hands of a few and at the cost of many. Um, so unfortunately, um, you know, tribal governments, it's just, it's bogged down by bureaucracy, lateral, you know, sometimes like, you know, some lateral stuff going on, nepotism, um, 
inefficiencies and lack of accountability. So honestly, um, you know, food systems, rebuilding the, the local food systems really has to, you know, come from, you know, grassroots organizations that are working, partnering with tribal governments, but working outside of them. Because um, honestly, like we just don't have any time to waste right now. We really don't. I feel it in my body, just this constant urgency and vibration that like um, the shit has already hit the fan. And from an indigenous lens, I have to say that, um, and I, I talked to um, our tribal historian, Jonathan Buffalo. Um, I was just like, Jonathan, are we, you know, um, like are we as indigenous people, I feel like we are in the apocalypse. Like we are experiencing the apocalypse. And he's like, no, actually that happened, uh, uh, you know, during, you know, uh, when, when um, colonization started. Colonization was the apocalypse. He said, we are in the post-apocalypse. This is what we are experiencing. This is what I feel in my body. And um, so I have to say that, like, you know, I only have two spoons. Most of my, I don't know if you, you know, know about the, the spoon theory, um, especially with disabilities. Um, but, like, most of my spoons are just used to cope, right, from this anxiety, from complex PTSD. So I want to say about investment, I want to say this. So first off, like, I think, like, anybody approaching tribal food systems and, and tribal economies and rebuilding of um, community from a, um, you know, um, an investment standpoint where they're looking to get a return on their investment. Are you looking to get a monetary return? Because um, you're managing these huge wealthy portfolios, right? And the return already happened. The return ha started 500 years ago where most, you know, in, in that process, the bulk of the nation's wealth was amassed in the hands of a few people. You already got your financial returns, right? Um, you already have all of the money. I don't know why you think you're, you know, it's okay to make money off of us. And really your investment, what your return is gonna be is in the restoration of the health, of the wellness, and the wholeness. We're owed that. I want to say something about PPI loans. PPI loans, I can't remember the number, but um, it's billions of dollars were forgiven in PPI loans in spite of widespread fraud. So why not give forgivable loans to grassroots food sovereignty efforts? You know, forgivable loans, that builds in some accountability, right? You know, but if if they stick the course, you know, make it forgivable. That's way more accountability than those PPI loans. And um, another thing, instead of food desert, so desert is a naturally occurring. You know, it's it's actually deserts are incredibly rich with biodiver biodiversity, undisturbed deserts, deserts whose ecosystems and peoples are intact. But what we, what we experience, and uh, whether we're, you know, out in the rural area, out on reservations for Meskwaki, we have a settlement, or if you're an urban, you know, um, underserved population, what it is, it's food apartheid. So it's, it's systemic, it's by design. And, um, yeah, I know it's time's up. I promised myself I would just, just take a minute. Take a minute. Yeah. So take a minute to wrap it up. So, uh, so much to say. Uh, so um, I think, like you know, what I would like to I would like to be funded. I really would like to be funded. Um, I have um, I have been uh, used and abused by uh, predominantly white organizations to able to you know tokenize so that they could get funding. Um, I have been um, extracted from and. Um, I'm done with that. Like, don't approach me with that extraction in your heart. Unfortunately, that's the waters we're swimming in because that is capital colonialist. Um, that's just how it operates. So 
a lot of us really, if we're really dedicated to this, we have a lot of work to do within ourselves. And we have to think about that indoctrination in instructive, extractive behavior towards each other and before and, and towards all of life on Earth and Mother Earth herself. And um, I don't know, I would like to I would like to build incubator farms, I would like to build makerspace, and I am working on a BIPOC Bill of Rights to prevent that type of um, tokenism and extraction from BIPOC folks that are partnering with nonprofits. Thank you. So um, <clears throat> the point of this panel, obviously, uh, is to, to just show or to discuss how, you know, uh, indigenous uh, foodways, uh, indigenous uh, traditional ecological knowledge, uh, indigenous ideologies are truly the antithesis to colonial capitalist farming practices. Um, and if we implement them, if we invest in them, we can curb the climate crisis and introduce a regenerative economy. Basically, what it comes down to um, is because I'm not a, a businessy person. Um, I'm an executive director of a small nonprofit, and it's just about land back. And that's the system that I want to say to you. Just, just keep that in mind. Just keep land back in your mind, um, and know that uh, almost 100% of agriculture, cultural land in this country is owned by white people. And look at what conditions the land is in because of that. Mm -hmm. So just keep that in mind and. Thank you so much for coming here today. Thank you.